Well, I hope I've done enough setup. I've changed things a little bit. I've got a different overhead camera that can give me 1080p. And we're going to get right into the Wounded Sky, Chapter 5. Um, let me know if there's just too much of me and not enough of the book in these videos if you've decided you like to watch things this way. Anyhow, Chapter 5. It was dark. No sound reached Jim. No sensations. His body was gone. His mind struggled in the darkness like a limited bird, to no avail. Without sound being involved, somewhere, someone was screaming. A horrible, anguished, terrified howl of inconsolable loss that went on and on forever. It couldn't have been him. He was choking, trying to breathe with lungs that weren't there. Death. That's what it is. We're all dying. The darkness didn't stop. But something else about it became evident, as if... He simply had been too preoccupied to notice. The darkness had stars in it. And he had a body again. She thrust along through the cold night, feeling the small stretches and contractions of her skin as she leaned away from the planet she had been orbiting, and the heat of its primary on her diminished. Soon enough now would come the deep dive into that place where starlight was stronger stuff, where the wine of it would run white-hot through her and free her for speeds she could never achieve in this calmer world. Then the true life would begin again. These tame circlings about planets were never more than times of rest between the real adventures. The great joy lay in streaking outward forever and ever, bathed in strange starlight, in passing through the waste places, in strength, exulting in her swiftness and her power, dealing with what she found. And since the joy, unshared, would have been empty, she had chosen companions who adventured during her times of rest, and rested while she adventured. They complimented her well. That was to be expected, for she had chosen them with great care. They desired the darkness as she did, though admittedly on a smaller scale. And even that would change some day. Some of them had the seeds of the great desire in them already, to love the journey not so much for the achievement of some purpose as for the journey itself. Several of them in particular were gradually coming to that state, the ones who sat oftenest at her heart and knew her will best, especially the chief of them, whom she was slowly training up in the way he should go. To her delight, her exaltation, he was learning. He had come to be aware of her selfness, to know her, in the small shadowy, shadowy way of her children. He would know her better yet. She would teach him everything there was. She would raise him up to be the equal of one of her own kind. And then, then, then Jim found himself back in a seat again, shaking all over. Emergence alarms were whooping all around him, and his people were looking frantically about the bridge like statues suddenly come to life. Status! Jim said and counted himself lucky that the word came out as a shout and not a squeak. We are undamaged, Captain, Spock's voice came, calm as always from his station. The damage control computers never even activated. Jim turned to Uhura. Injuries? Uhura took the transdator out of her ear with the air of a woman being yammered at. None, sir, but the crew is very upset. Whatever they were expecting inversion to be like, it wasn't that. I can't blame them, Jim said. He was still deep in that feeling that he had first experienced when Katulik showed him the drive running, with the difference that, this time, he remembered something of what had happened to him. Tell them we'll put a report out on ship's channels as soon as we figure out what happened. And where we are, Uhura said, glancing at the front view screen. Jim looked too and agreed. Mr. Sulu, Mr. Chekhov, he said. I thought you had a core set for Iota Sculptora system. I've been there. This is not it. It certainly was not. Iota Sculptoris was a tame little M2 star with several subspace relay stations in orbit. Whatever star... Whatever the star was that hung centered and blazing on the view screen, it was not tame. It was a white giant, so violently luminous even at this distance, that the screen had already backed itself down to minimum intensity and was reading out warnings of imminent sensor overload. Enterprise was coasting around it in a wide-mouthed hyperbola. 
in a wide mouth hyperbola at about 0.2 c, so that it was easy to see the concentric globular shells of luminous gas in which the star was nested, shells shading from incandescent violet nearest the star to a deep, eye-searing indigo furthest out. The surrounding star field wasn't dull either. Near space for parsecs around was littered with blue and blue-white giants, a scattered splendor of burning gems. But the blinding white terror about which Enterprise swung put them all to shame. Is that what I think it is? Jim said. A wolf rayet star, Captain, Spock said. There is not one in the whole Federation, or, for that matter, within the range of the long-range survey ship we have. Our presence here tells us we are a long way from home, but we are also most fortunate, for no Federation ship has ever been this close to one. It would be a great loss to science if we did not stay long enough to take some measurements. Get a spectrum on it, Jim said to Sulu. If it's one that's been detected from home, we can use it to determine our position. Aye, sir. Jim turned back toward Spock, noticing with idle amusement that behind him Sulu was betting Chekhov that he could tell which star it was without looking in the catalog. Chekhov took the bet. Mr. Spock, Jim said, if I understand the nature of these stars, this is not exactly a safe place for us to loiter. All those shells are supposed to be what's left of large portions of the star's atmosphere, which it blows off every now and then, with considerable force, I might add. Look at the blue shift on that inside shell. Not to slight Mr. Sulu's efforts, but I think I've had enough Nove for one day. If that thing gets cranky and decides to go off while we're here, the odds against it, Captain. The odds are against it, Captain. That's what they said about Pompeii, Jim said, not reassured. And look at them. You can. In museums. It's Zeta Ten Scorpii, Captain. Sulu said, one out of the side of his mouth, and more quietly he said to Chekhov, Pay me. I'll have it for you Tuesday. This is most remarkable, Captain, Spock said. This datum indicates that we have been flung approximately 5,700 light years, nearly a twentieth of the diameter of the galaxy, along a heading almost diametrically opposite to the one laid in, right across both the Federation, and the Klingon Empire, in fact, and into space as yet unexplored by any species we know. This is another excellent reason for us to remain here for a short time. We will have access to views of the galactic core that have never been available due to the presence of interstellar dust. Which brings up another interesting question, Jim said, and hit the communicator button on his chair. Engineering? Scott here. Scotty, are the engines all right? Oh, aye, Captain. The engines are working, but I dinna know why. Are you all right, Scotty? Aye. My brains are still spinning, but at least they're doing it in the right direction now. Yours, maybe. But Catullix? Where is she? Chimes rattled. Here, Captain. I thought we were supposed to be going to Iota Sculptoris, Commander. So we were, sir. Evidently, however, Mr. Sulu's Nova had other plans for us. Though we stabilized the ship's course, the star's explosion imparted a great deal of energy to us, and recomplicated the vector equations thereby. Transmission of shockwave through the interstellar medium, Spock said from his station. Normally, that is impossible. Hard vacuum does not transmit conventional shockwaves, but when a Nova explodes... Near space, for several astronomical units around, can be full of its liberated atmosphere within seconds. It's been postulated that other space may be similarly affected. Gravity waves and other such sub-etheric disturbances can theoretically be propagated in such a fashion, affecting us even in warp. I suspect we now have confirmation for that theory. Wonderful. The Nova kicked us in the pants. Precise in mood, if not in particulars, Catullic said. Her chiming sounded sour, as if she considered the malfunctioning of her drive a slur on her personally. Scotty, are the warp engines all right? Well, damage control didn't report anything, but computers have blind spots. Captain, I didn't know what the time parameters are in the order Starfleet gave you, but 
would it be violating them much to give me a little downtime so I can check my pure burns? I mean, the warp drive and the impulse engines. My own self? We did a lot of wild swooping about in the neighborhood of 109 Pissim. No question about it. I think we can manage it. How much time do you need? A day would be good. Oh, <laughs> Jim thought. I was all ready for the big jump, and now this. A day it is. But make it count, Scotty. Another case of transitus interruptus like this, and my vector equations may need checking. Jim let out a long breath. I tell you, I'm not happy about the stroke of luck that landed us here next to a wolf ray at star, however rare and interesting it is. I don't think luck had much to do with it, Captain, Katilik said. Nor do I, sir, Spock said. He was looking at his station screens with that expression that Kirk knew from old. Utter fascination. I have been examining the spectra of 109 Piscium that we took before we left its neighborhood, and the spectrum of Zeta 10 Scorpii here. There are some intriguing correlations. I shall pursue them further. But I would suggest that the inversion drive's vector equations were deranged slightly by the presence of the nova in both real space and subspace, so that it sorted for an energy source of roughly equivalent type. And here we are. A wolf rayet star, after all, can be considered as a kind of very restrained, irregular nova. It's the irregularity that worries me, Jim said. For a moment, he just sat and gazed out at the frightful blaze of Zeta-10 Scorpii that hung there, nested in its concentric, fiery shells like some god's resplendent version of an ancient Terran Chinese carved toy. No matter. We'll stay and take your pictures, at least for a little while. Heaven forbid I should ignore astronomical research on this mission. First things first, though. Katulik. Can you keep the drive from getting deranged again? Surely, Captain. It's a minor adjustment, like many others we had to make during testing, though we had little chance for this particular problem to come up. Her chiming sounded cheerful again. No matter. I'll soon have it debugged. Jim smiled and said nothing as to the cause. Fine. Proceed. And Scotty, don't start a major overhaul. If this star cries wolf, we may have to get it out of here in a hurry. Katulik, how long will your repairs take? I'll be done with my revisions to the drive long before Montgomery's finished with his poor bairns. Long before Montgomery's, long before Montgomery's finished with his poor barns, Captain. Three hours minimum. Bairns, Scotty said firmly. Oh, thank you. Execute, then. Kirk out. Jim sat back in the command seat and exhaled. There was nothing left to do now but wait and think what inversion had been like. That was even worse than waiting. It was almost his off shift anyway, and he needed someone to talk to. Mr. Sulu, he said, plot us a nice wide orbit around that thing and put our screens up so that as little energy leaves the ship as possible. If I've got to stay in this neighborhood, I want to tiptoe around that star and not do anything that might wake it up. Spock, the con's yours for the moment. Uh, are you about to go off shift? I am so scheduled, Captain. Spock was intent on his screens. But these spectra... Jim knew fascination when he saw it. Do what needs to be done about the spectra, Spock. And put a watch on that star. I don't want it to so much as burp without being notified. I'm going to get some lunch. When you're free, if that's this shift, I'll be eating the officer's lounge if you care to join me. He got up from the command chair and headed left as Spock stepped down from his right and seated himself. Their old habit of shift relief, half dance and half wordless joke. But Jim didn't even need to look at Spock to know his mind was far from the joke right now. Mizuhura, he was saying as the lift's doors opened for Jim. Be so good as to call Stellar Dynamics and have them begin analysis on the data running at my station, with emphasis on the relationships among the hydrogen lines. See if Mr. Benford is on shift at the moment. The door slid closed. Deck six, Jim said, and heard echoes in his mind, and wondered why. The beginnings of misgivings were coming up. I wanted this drive. 
Why am I so nervous? For once, Jim had no eyes for the window in the officer's lounge, despite the radiant view outside. He managed to get a good part of his stake down before the ship's computer spoke softly to him, telling him that Spock had logged off the bridge and instructed the ship and instructed the lift to drop him at deck six. Jim bolted the rest of the steak, had the table dispose of it, and was working on a salad when Spock came quietly in. May I join you, sir? Jim waved a forkful of greenery in invitation. Spock sat down, touched the pressure-sensitive area on the table that brought up the menu, eyed it, spoke a letter and number combination. The table's transport. The table's transporter materialized another salad. Boston lettuce, from the looks of it, with odd yellow objects scattered through it. Jim looked at them curiously as Spock started eating. Something Vulcan? Spock shook his head, finished his bite. Terran, originally. A variant from... A variant form grown on McDade, Xanthopipericum, Flagrantum Ellison. It was once referred to as Szechuan Death, though I... Jim waved away the explanation. Later for botany, Spock. You look preoccupied. What is it with the spectra, anyway? Irregularities, Spock said. The problem is more easily demonstrated than discussed. Screen, he said to the table. It stopped pretending to be Sargolian redwood and faded to black. Science station readout, Spock said, and added a string of numbers. Authorization. Sorry. Authorization said the table. Spock laid his hand on the screen. It read it, then displayed four sets of spectra, strips of rainbow light and assortments of bright-colored lines. The most intriguing part of the problem, Spock said, lies in the fact that no two novae ever go off in exactly the same way. Some of them go this way and that, he indicated one set of data, the few scattered bright lines of an emission spectrum and the dark and the dark-lined rainbow strip of an absorption spectrum, while another star, seemingly no different from the first, will go that way and this. He pointed at the second set of spectra, in which both bright and dark lines were shifted much further into the blue. But, by and large, the actual nova event will conform to one of these two sets of patterns. Now, this one, Spock said, pointing at a new specimen that appeared near the top of the screen is the catalog spectrum of 109 Piscium, the one in our files. This one, he indicated another, is the one our computer obtained when it made its initial lock upon the star from ten light years out. And this... And this one, the computer took just before Mr. Sulu threw the ship into warp, practically in the star's corona. He is to be commended, by the way, for the foresight he displayed in thinking to have the computer do this while he was already so thoroughly occupied. Spock set a salad aside, out of the way of the next set of spectra that came up beside the first one. Now, these, Captain, are of Zeta Ten Scorpii. Note how the spectrum is severely blue-shifted, as in that last spectrum of 109 Piscium. The cause is the motion of those shells of gas you were concerned about. Here again are the catalog spectra, and the ones Mr. Sulu took on our arrival. Can you see the alteration in the positions and relationships of the lines in the brightness lines in the bright line spectra? It is most subtle. I can see it. Barely, Jim said. But what does it mean? Captain, Spock said. There is one confirmed common factor. One outside effect present while each of these stars was in the process of going, or in Zeta Ten's case, almost going Nova. We were there. Jim nodded slowly. But how can a starship possibly affect a star? The way we affected 109 Piscium, for one, said Spock. But this alteration is something different. Subtler, as I said. And at the same time, most alarming. The situation is not made simpler by the fact that this ship is carrying apparatus not carried before by any other. I discard as irrelevant the effect of our warp drive as a cause for these changes. 
We have never come near the warp effect boundary while in the neighborhood of Zeta-10 Scorpii, but I would give a great deal for a spectrum of that star near Razalgethi by which Catullic emerged, one taken at the time of her emergence. Two such occurrences might be coincidence, though I would give you long odds against it. But three... Two occurrences, Jim thought. Spock, he said. May I ask you something in confidence? Spock put up an eyebrow, tapped the table to vanish the rainbow strips of the spectra, and turn it to Redwood again. Captain, I am at your disposal. Did you experience any... odd effects during the inversion transit? Spock put down his fork and leaned on his elbows, steepling his fingers in that characteristic meditative gesture of his. Captain, he said, it is partly for that reason that I came so quickly from the bridge. I have been seriously considering declaring myself unfit for duty, secondary to such an occurrence. I believe I am even ready to speak to Dr. McCoy about it. Jim nodded, being most careful to keep his face still. He wasn't going to add to Spock's distress by letting either surprise or amusement at that last statement show. Might one ask? One might, Spock said. He paused for a few breaths, space not looking at Jim. I experienced a most unnerving sense of the loss of time. Unnerving in its literal definition, for all bodily sensation was absent but the loss of duration was the most prominent effect, and the distress it caused was considerable. Spock's eyes snapped back into the here and now, and he looked at Jim. As might be expected, for by our definitions, life needs time to move through, or it is not life. Jim nodded. That was... That was what the screaming was, he thought. My mind screaming for time, where there was none the way lungs scream for oxygen in a vacuum. You breathe and breathe, but it does you no good. I experienced something similar, he said. Distress is a mild word for it. I had more than that, though. Spock lifted an eyebrow at Jim, waiting. Jim hesitated, somewhat embarrassed now that he had come right down to it. It was... I was the ship without there actually being thought, at least what I would have called thought, there was sentience, a sense of incredible power, of strength uh, and swiftness, and of self-assurance without there really being a self, a yearning outward, a delight in the yearning, an unshakable sense of purpose, taken for granted the way we expect to keep on breathing. It was almost, and he hunted for words, almost an apotheosis of mechanicity, if that makes any sense. It doesn't make much sense to me. A breath of laughter escaped Jim. I've always thought of myself in terms of the ship, as if I were a possessor. But the ship didn't... doesn't see it that way. I may be the possessed. Fascinating. Spock was still a moment, then said, Captain, have you ever been to the Beta Pavona system? The fourth planet out. Jim shook his head. He had heard of the place in his studies, but even the most active commander never got to see a hundredth of the known worlds. The primary is ordinary enough, a type A5, but the third planet is ringed. Dawn in its super-equatorial regions is a most intriguing phenomenon. In the heart of night, the sky is wholly black, but as the Terminator approaches a point on the ground... The rings stand up blue and green in the east like the shard of a curved sword. They grow. They arch over the sky. Then the sun comes up, and the blue and green blaze silver against orange heaven. This time the surprise at Spock's sudden poetic turn of phrase was harder to conceal, but Jim managed it. Spock, I think you lost me. Does your last visit to Beta Pavonis have something to do with your, uh, experience? It does indeed, Captain, Spock said, looking at him with the faintest touch of unease. I 
have never been to Beta Pavonis IV. Jim closed his mouth. Nor am I likely to be there in the future, Spock said. The planet was surveyed 34 standard years ago and immediately placed on interdict status, 5BR for a minimum of 200 years. Religious warfare, Jim said. No contact, whatever, until the situation resolves itself. Yes. Yet, I was there, Spock said, his eyes going distant again. We were encamped by the hundreds of thousands on a great barren plain, waiting for the battle to begin, waiting for a sign. The sword came up in the east, and we were ready. But the sign came otherwise than we expected. It rained stars. We ran across the field to where our enemies were encamped and embraced them. Our brothers. Jim saw Spock's hands trembling where they were laced together. Saw Spock stop them from trembling. It was a most emotional experience, being there when peace broke out. Experiencing the overwhelming relief, the joy, the Vulcan's eyes came back to the here and now again. Then the experience ceased, and I found myself at my post, completing the instructions I had given, completing the instructions, completing the instructions I had been given, completing the instructions I had begun giving my library computer before we entered transit. Jim asked the table for a mug of hot tea and sipped it a moment in silence. Could it have been a mind link of some sort? I think it unlikely, considering the range. So, sir, with your permission, I think I had best go submit myself to the doctor's ministrations. Half a moment. Jim said, touching Spock's arms to keep him touching Spock's arm to keep him from getting up. Calm function, he said to the table. Sick bay. McCoy. Bones sounded disgruntled. Jim was surprised at that, and, to a lesser extent, by one of the voices talking animatedly in the background, a voice he didn't recognize. Jim realized instantly that it was one of the replacement crew. When one is shut up with only 400 people for long periods of time, every voice becomes familiar. But he put his curiosity aside for the moment. Bones, I had an interesting experience during that transit. You too, huh? McCoy sounded thoughtful. I thought maybe it was just me. No, others have had it. I want everyone in the crew who had anything like it checked. Give the order, McCoy said. I'm not going anywhere anyway. Damn paperwork. And another thing, Jim. Save it. I'll stop by. Kirk out. Jim looked at Spock. Care to accompany me? Yes, Captain. Though I must still declare myself unfit for... Oh, Spock put a field around it. I'll lay you long odds that everyone in the ship had unsettling experiences like ours. And besides, since your experience occurred in zero time, nothing can have happened to you because... Happening requires duration, and there is no duration in zero time. Starfleet is hardly going to be concerned about something that never happened. Neither am I. So what are you worrying about? Spock looked sidewise at his captain with the old, good-humored glint in his eye as they stood up. The fact that I am still left with the experience. However, that was neatly reasoned, Captain. You are becoming adept at getting paradox to serve your turn. Well, isn't it the Vulcans who say that the doors of truth are guarded by paradox and confusion, and that if you attempt to handle them by turning your back on them, the truth will remain closed behind you? If we did not say it, Spock said soberly, but without that glint leaving his eye, I will see to it that we do from now on. You do that. Let's get down to sickbay. And I think I'm going to leave it there. Just read chapter 5. That's enough for one night.